morning, Malacanang Press Corps. Welcome to press briefing. The presidential spokesperson Ernesto Abella. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Today we have a, a, a as our resource person, presidential advisor for entrepreneurship, Mr. Jose Maria Concepcion III. He is the president and CEO of RFM Corporation, a major food and beverage company in the Philippines. He concurrently holds the position of chairman of the board of. Unilever RFM Ice Cream and a director of Concepcion Industrial Corporation. He has been hailed by Forbes Asia as one of the 48 heroes of philanthropy in 2011. He was also a recipient of the Anvil Award of Excellence for Advocacy, Public Relations Society of the Philippines in 2007, 14, and 15. He's young, innovative, and progressive. Last night I joined their dinner for uh, ASEAN Business Advisory Council, and I was pleasantly surprised to hear him talk about, and this is the first time I heard it from Big Business, when he talked about inclusive prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen of the Malacanang Press Corps, let us give a warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Mr. Joey Concepcion. Good afternoon. Uh, oh, good morning. First of all, as an advisor to the President on Entrepreneurship, uh, and concurrently, I hold the ASEAN back uh, chairmanship for the private sector. Uh, the last two days, we've launched uh, the ASEAN initiatives together with the President uh, in Malacanang with uh, Secretary Mon Lopez. And uh, yesterday uh, afternoon, we had our first meeting with the Council about 20 of the council members from the nine ASEAN countries came here for that meeting. The vision really I have since I started as an advisor to the president for entrepreneurship is basically to look at uh, greater prosperity for a lot of Filipino people. If we look at the level of poverty in the Philippines, it has remained basically the same for the last so many years. When I look at our ASEAN neighbors around, we seem to be lagging behind, not progressing. Let me share with you some information. For example, like this is a 2014 uh, year data that was given to me. The Philippines then was about 25.8%. Vietnam was at 13.5%. Indonesia is at 11.3%. Thailand is at 10.5. Malaysia is 0.6. And of course, Singapore has no problem together with Brunei. But what is, what is quite clear here is that the Vietnam poverty rate has fallen down from 60 to 20% over the last two decades. The challenge that our country faces is that 99.6% of enterprise in this country belong to the micro, small, and medium. Just 0.4% belong to the large and extra-large corporations out there, including our corporation. And that is reflective of the current uh, uh, level of poverty in our country today, and one of the reasons why our president won the elections. How do we make growth more inclusive? And that's the biggest challenge. And that's why as the uh, council basically accepted my recommendation that the theme for this year for the business sector is really partnering for change, prosperity for all. It mirrors what we are doing locally in the Philippines today. We uh, have partnered, the movement of GoNegosia has partnered with uh, Secretary Mon Lopez of the Department of Trade and Industry. And likewise, we'll be partnering also with Secretary Pinol of the Department of Agriculture. Mentorship is really a powerful tool. We, can, we can't wait for our educational system to improve. There are many entrepreneurs out there already who need a lifeline, advice, guidance, and direction on how they can move from basically survival entrepreneurship to sustainability. That's why 
70% of those of the 99.6% of the entire enterprise in this country that belong to MSMEs are really more micro and small. And mentorship is one tool that is going to be employed this year together with the Department of Trade and Industry. And likewise with the Department of Agriculture, we're going to do a lot of mentorship program. But then another call is, I think the government has to look at a change in direction towards, the, to me, the conditional cash transfer. We give about 65 billion pesos to those that are really at the bottom of the pyramid, which is fine, which is good. But frankly, it does not really teach them how to fish. We're just giving them the fish. So we have to change that. And my proposal, and I've asked, uh, proposed this to some of the secretaries that maybe over the next 10 years that should move towards more government intervention. Maybe 10% of that should gradually move to interventions like uh, more funding towards DTI's shared service facility, the Department of Science program called Setup. And more money should be spent in Department of Agriculture giving our smaller entrepreneurs, farmers, equipment. Likewise, I'm told that the president soon will launch uh, the uh, loan initiatives that will be given to micro and small entrepreneurs. The vision is one billion for every region. So I think, and I encourage the government to really move towards this direction. I mean, not cutting off the conditional trans cash transfer overnight but doing it over a period of 10 years and shifting that fund towards still the, the poor entrepreneurs, the micro entrepreneurs and small entrepreneurs who don't mind paying an interest, but their challenge is really on collateral. Many of them don't have collateral to be able to borrow money. So they will have to look at mechanisms like this initiatives of government interventions to set up SSF and lending them equipments to their cooperatives to give them a chance so that eventually with mentorship and government intervention in helping them get their business beyond survival to sustainable, then we can change it. If we look at the other Asian countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, especially Thailand, the other sector is agriculture. We are challenged by this because poverty in this country will forever be there unless we really fix our agricultural sector. One can say that the agrarian reform program did not work. It's my belief that it actually made things really harder. You cannot compete with the big guys who own 100, 200, 300 hectares and practice corporate farming versus a farmer who tills the land for three to five hectares. How can he compete? Yes, okay, you can encourage them to join cooperatives. But even through cooperatives, we can know that when there's so many owners, sometimes the challenge is the management of the cooperatives. So we are proposing a different way of thinking. And uh, I'm glad that we have two secretaries that are very open-minded. So in the recent meeting we had with the president, together with the very large conglomerates uh, last week, one of the discussions really was for our large cooperatives, or some of you call them taipans, is for them to engage, not only growing their business. They, we all have to do that. We are all publicly listed, and it's part of our mission to really invest in the Philippines and expand and hire people what we are trying to do now was a project that we started December 19 with the president on Sulu. It was the initiative that we felt that uh, the president wanted to see how we can bring about the business community to really help the people in Sulu as, you know, uh, war is going on against Abu Sayyaf. And I'm glad that many of our uh, big conglomerates, our big cooperatives, have responded. For example, in the case of um, Michael Tan, uh, they promised that they will start flying to um, Sulu by July, which is going to be a first. 
uh, the MVP group is uh, fixing all their telecom facilities that have been damaged by the bombings. Uh, he has promised to um, look into a coconut, uh, virgin coconut oil plant that has been abandoned there. He is uh, finalizing the list of equipments uh, that he will donate to the hospital in Sulu. Uh, Ramon Ang has, is looking into uh, a power plant, among other things. Uh, we have another entrepreneur, Rosalinda Wee, who is looking into the seaweeds that are abundant in Sulu. She's the largest uh, Caribbean producer. We have another entrepreneur, Tennyson Chen, who is looking into poultry. We have a group of uh, uh, mentors headed by Tota Barcelona who is going to help them do small scale farming. And the list goes on. Of course, a lot of initiatives from the other entrepreneurs uh, who are going to offer uh, homes to Gawat Kalinga, which will be built by Gawat Kalinga. The classrooms are going to be built by the Filipino Chinese Federation. So there are countless of initiatives that we are going to be doing in the next months to help Sulu. They list among the areas with highest level of poverty. And likewise, we have also decided as a group to look at the other 10 areas or the other nine areas that uh, have extreme poverty. Uh, initially, we were looking at the top uh, 10, but uh, of the top 10, basically eight come from Mindanao. So that leaves two areas for Visayas. So we decided to just rethink that whole plan and follow the Department of Agriculture's model, which basically allocates four areas in Mindanao, three areas in Visayas, and three areas in Luzon, so that all different regions will at least have uh, some support from the private sector. So this was our commitment to the president during that dinner, that beyond our business of growing and hiring people, uh, we will do this effort to help uh, our president uh, you know, fulfill his promise of change and uplift the lives of the poorest of the poor. Of course, we can't you know, focus on the entire Philippines. There is just poverty everywhere. So we have to focus on the areas that have what we call extreme poverty, and that was our commitment. And again, this is going to be a project that we will do with the Office of the President and with the support of all the different government agencies that will, uh, especially in Cebu, Cebu, properly secure us because we know uh, there is a lot of uh, conflict in, the, in, in Cebu. So in, in, in short, I've also shared this with Secretary Bello, that the current contractualization that is being discussed today has to have one thing in mind. It should not be either pro-management or pro-label. It should be pro-jobs. To me, that is the fundamental objective. If we are looking at inclusive growth, greater prosperity, we have to look at greater job generation. To me, that is important. And if contractualization is going to stifle job creation, then we will not be able to achieve greater prosperity for all. When I've talked to the other council members in the uh, different ASEAN regions, there is no minimum wage in some of their countries. They don't have anything as contractualization. So we have to understand that we are not alone in this region. We compete, like us in the private sector, we compete with the other guys, we fight for that market share. And the same thing, we, ha we compete. Even if ASEAN is one and trying to be one, we still compete with these countries. And the, what, what makes an investor want to come to your country is not only the ease of doing business, but what is the most important is that they remain, you, that country has to be competitive. Competitive in terms of labor rates, power rates, all of that. So if we're going to make it a challenge for the private sector to make the cost of labor just increase, then we will lose our competitiveness. I'm not saying that you know, 
labor should not get their fair share. What I'm saying is that we have to create more jobs. That is the bottom line. With President Trump being elected, he is rethinking the entire landscape of how America will move forward. He's not talking anymore of you know, sharing America's wealth with the other countries in the world. He wants to bring back jobs to America. While many people will say that it's impossible and difficult, yes, it may be. He may realize that. But the mere action and threat can prevent companies from moving forward and expanding. For example, in call centers, you, we've seen in the newspapers today that uh, there are less interest of expansion. So that, that fear that uh, President Trump is sharing with the business community will cause people to hold back for a while. So we have to keep all of this in mind. Our, 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 what is the top most mind in our focus should really be job generation, prosperity for all. Entrepreneurs out there who are surviving, we have to bring them to sustainability. We have to increase the workforce because more and more of the young kids are joining the workforce. We are seeing still ex an exodus of people looking for greener pastures overseas. And to a large extent, you can't stop that. And in a way, it does help bring about inclusivity. And that's why when we thought of branding inclusive growth, we said, oh, the best brand really is to call it Kapatid. Because I see it with our OFW workers. To me, they epitomize what inclusive growth is from an individual level. You see relatives who live in America, uh, American citizens still remitting money to their family. To me, that is sharing, a big brother sharing to a brother, sister, or the children, or the, the parents. The remittances for education, housing, even a negotiable. So that, to me, is very symbolic in, in, in the entire Filipino community. And that's what, we, what inspired us to call inclusive growth Kapatid. And that was my basic call to all our big brothers, especially our conglomerates, our Taipans, and the large and the even medium-sized entrepreneurs, that prosperity cannot be achieved if we are not inclusive. And in Asia, the, among the Asian brothers that we have, I told them, what is the use of celebrating 50 years if we cannot achieve prosperity among all of us, 10 nations? And they all agreed. And they all agreed to adopt the MS, MSME program that we're looking at this year. And for the first time this year, the ASEAN Business Council will maybe abandon We'll, 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 we'll change the event for this year. Instead of having an investment uh, business conference in November, which is the event for all the leaders who will be coming here, we will do be doing something different. We will be doing where all ASEAN council members will come and help our micro and small and medium entrepreneurs and mentor them. So it will be a different thing. Everybody will not be coming here and wearing suits. They will be out here to mentor, to teach, to inspire uh, many of our entrepreneurs in various sectors, from the services sector, to technology, to agriculture, and more especially agriculture. And again, unless we really change the landscape of agriculture, to me, agri is the game changer for poverty eradication. If we don't and do not achieve that, then this country will forever be a poor country. And Secretary Pinot understands that. His heart is in it. But he needs the entire support of the private sector. And we, I'm glad that many are responding. They started responding by buying from the onion farmers, you know, their onions, when they were asked to buy. And we want more farmers to be able to sell to the large supermarkets, the SMs, the Robinsons, the Pier Golds, the Rustans, and all of them. They're responding. So that, to me, is the real essence of inclusive growth, where the private sector and government really come together as one and really help fight poverty. Thank you.
MPC questions? MPC questions? Laila, do you have questions? Okay. A microphone, please. Good morning, sir. Sir, uh, what was the response of the government officials when you pitched the idea of scaling down the CCT over 10 years? Were they receptive to this? Because I understand this isn't just a parang social tool, it can, it's also a political one. Oh, uh, it's an idea that has been floated. The reaction has not been there yet. PCCI also has adopted the same thinking. No? So I think uh, over time, I, I think this will have to be absorbed. I think every secretary understands that more funds have to be given to those who work hard. No? And uh, I'm, uh, the basic logic is that one is a dole out. It ends there. It's not recurring. The other one is you're giving it to an entrepreneur, a micro and a small, who cannot get funding or cannot get a loan because he has no collateral. But he has the passion, the initiative. So whatever capital or fund that you give him, assuming the failure rate is even at the highest 50%, no? because uh, chances of failure is always high. So assuming that is 50%, at least it has a 50% chance of recurring. It becomes a recurring thing. And from that, he can hire more people. So yes, the other one is a dole out, the person will survive, but it, it, it's, just, it's, it's just a lifeline, forever a lifeline. And that, to me, is not long term. I don't know how many countries in ASEAN do that. No? But definitely what I see is that a lot of them support their micro and small entrepreneurs. And in fairness, I think the Department of Agriculture, to me, has to get more funding. I think everybody has to realize that unless the Department of Agriculture increases that budget that's directed towards the farmers and the fishermen and properly used, we're not going to get anywhere, quite frankly. I, I think you, you can look around. 70% of our land is agri land. Sir, clarification on your statement on contractualization. Are you saying um, it has to, the government has to go slow on implementing this because it might uh, drive up labor costs? First of all, Endo and co contractualization is, uh, is, there's a confusion here. Endo is not contractualization. Endo is technically illegal. That's, you hire a person for five months, you let him go, you hire him again. That is illegal. What we're talking about here uh, is the new uh, department order, whereby uh, we are close to an agreement already, basically. Uh, and I've told the secretary, uh, in fact, I texted him this morning, that it is very hard for labor and management to come to an agreement. Eh? The Secretary of Labor will have to make the decision himself. Eh? And to me, I, I told him what is important is we have to keep in mind that job gener generation is the key point, which should drive basically the new department order, which means is we have proposed to him that all service providers today in that department order will have to hire the people as regular employees. Today that does not exist except for security guards. No? So every agency, contracting agency, will have to ensure that that employee is not a 555 especially in, that, in their agency. They will be regular employees. They will be given the right government benefits, no? the benefits according to law. BL, SL, a retirement pay, a severance pay. So they will be hired, not maybe by the company, but by the outsource provider. That's a big difference. That's a big, big plus. That's not done today. So to me, the workforce should be happy about that. Right now, even government hires the biggest number of uh, contractuals. Now, it's fine if the government outsources it to the service providers, but at least they will have job security when, even if they're working for agencies. So there is nothing wrong. The entire world is moving to outsourcing. I mean, it is a fact. Everything is being outsourced. In fact, America has outsourced the entire manufacturing to China and the entire BPO to us. So we are the beneficiaries. That's making them competitive. That's the way the world is. Okay, thank you, Laila. Raymond Tinasa, Bombolajo.
so just to sorry expand what you meant on how would you help the small farmers in their agri business so aside from buying their products and selling them to the big supermarkets what else can we do or can you do to help them especially i understand i am from the province so i know how these small farmers would have having hard in having this uh fund or capital to finance their uh, agricultural or the planting and even to harvesting? First of all, the, the intervention in terms of mentorship, mm -hmm. technical training programs, that has to be done. Okay, once you have the proper training programs and uh, all of that, then there has to be a mechanism for them to be able to, to operate. They have to have the right equipment. They have to have loans to be able to fund their working capital. Now. Uh, sometimes these are provided by traders. We all know that. And when they provide that, uh, then they, are, they have to sell their produce to the traders. And sometimes we have the good traders and the not so good traders who take advantage of the farmers. No? So I think it is a balance. We cannot also eradicate all the traders, but hopefully we can make the traders more socially minded that we, that they think of the farmers as real partners. Uh, corporate farming, let me give you an example of an individual, uh, this entrepreneur, uh, Yazaki Torres, uh, Mr. Torres. What he has done was basically to use his rural bank, he aggregated some land, leased it, and provided loans to his farmers to plant rice. So the rice that um, is produced, he now buys that back and uses it for all his employees in Yazaki Torres. So that is a one model of an inclusive growth. No? Now, we, if we, uh, Secretary Mani asked me the other day, can we now encourage more rice farmers to plant hybrid rice? His strategy was to, for the private sector to buy hybrid rice. In other words, part of uh, the pay of the, the employee will be given in rice. In concept, it is correct because he believes that hybrid rice is the right way to go. I mean, this has been professed by Henry Vivian Leon, one of the entrepreneurs, because you'll have you'll increase the level of productivity and et cetera, et cetera. No, so that is one action that we are looking right now: how to help S Secretary Mani in getting private sector to experiment in buying the rice and giving it to our employees. But we will only buy. He wants us to only buy hybrid rice coming from the farmers. So he has to prepare that structure. But that is just an idea of trying to get private <coughs> sector to be more inclusive. In other words, why not? If there is a demand for hybrid rice, then what will happen? More farmers will plant hybrid rice, and they will become more competitive. So it's true so what you mentioned, that agriculture should be the prime mover of our economy now, because it, we are technically, practically, we are a farmland. But how can we, uh, how should I say, how can we make it that uh, work when some developers among your ranks are already buying out agricultural runs to develop houses and any other developer develop uh, projects, housing projects in the agricultural in the provinces? That can work. happen. Yeah, and uh, that is a challenge. I mean as we can see in the southern Luzon from Batangas onward, that has moved into industrial estate parks. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, in the end of the day, if our farmers will not be competitive and they cannot compete, what will happen is what you see today. So either they now join the workforce as uh, employees of the different parks, which is also not bad, but then again, there has to be a balance. No? Not every area in this country can have uh, an industrial park. No? Uh, it's just maybe fortunate that the southern area is very close to the ports that uh, attract the, the confluence of all of these industrial parks. But that's still very small compared to the, the total land area out there. And uh, if you see the success of the different ASEAN countries, uh, once upon a time, we were sending out and I think till today we're still sending out a lot of these students <coughs> who come here to learn. But somehow we can't seem to get our act. And I, I believe Secretary Pino, Manny Pinon has the heart, no? he has the vision. 
and he has our support. I am not an agri guy. I am a businessman. I, I look at it in terms of, okay, scale. If you don't have scale, you can't compete. If you're only running three hectares, five hectares, you <coughs> cannot compete against the big boys in Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. No way. So we have to look at encourage back cor corporate farming. There has to be a structure whereby uh, either lands can be aggregated and given to an entrepreneur to, to hire these people. If they can't, the farmers cannot be entrepreneurs, at least they can work for the, the, the corporation that will, will uh, at least lease or own the land and be able to focus their production towards, whether it's palm oil, corn, rice, or whatever. The others can go into small-scale farming, and uh, the proponent here is basically this entrepreneur called Toto Barcelona, who is focused on uh, small cases. And we have also asked William Dar to help us, by the way. Thank you, Raymond. Thanks. Ace Romero. Just one question. Uh, what do you think will happen if the government does not move away from the CCP? What will be the long-term e effect? I don't know. I, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, it can still stay there if the government has still money to keep that and still fund massively the initiatives on government interventions in helping micro and small, then, then fine. But if I have this much resource and I have to make a choice, I will help those that are hanging on to life. I mean, in other words, really these people that uh, live on a day-to-day -day basis. But gradually, you have to shift that slowly to something that becomes really recurring. It cannot be forever. That's my point. It just cannot be a forever. But do you think the recipients will be forever in a poverty trap if we don't move away from that program, which is you say is just giving fish instead of teaching them then how to fish? This is where TESDA comes in. This is where the big capitates like SM is going to embark a project. Part of the SALU project, SM and other uh, big conglomerates are coming together and partnering with TESDA in skills training program. And maybe... Th you know, in this area is there where we can focus uh, TESDA, especially in the areas with severe poverty. And then uh, as they're trained and, uh, and deserving of the job, then the private sector can hire them. So, you know, I cannot see, for as long as you speak English, you will find a job. You will enter a call center. That's the very minimum today. There is definitely a shortage of skilled people. The problem is, how do we make our non-skilled to be skilled? To me, it's simple. If you have, you know, English, speak English well, you can easily go to any BPO out there who's offering incentives to people. So, again, you have to do something about your life. I mean, <coughs> to me, being poor is a motivation. I've seen a lot of people in poverty who are extremely motivated to improve their life. And you can see that. Our OFWs are highly motivated. Why? They could have stayed here, been satisfied, maybe gotten the CCT, but they moved out. Why did they move out? Because they want to give their child a better future. They're sacrificing their family time, their the graduation, and all of those activities that they could spend here for a long-term benefit for their kids. So to me, that is, that is the difference. So CCT is fine. You can keep it there, but eventually that has to migrate towards more government interventions, assuming our budget is limited. But of course, if we have a lot of money, then you can keep the CCT. You can increase the government interventions that are directed towards helping micro and small. And you have to increase the Department of Agriculture's budget. There is no way for us to become reduce the level of poverty and be and become and help everybody become prosperous if the DA budget will be that way. Okay, last question, Ted Tuvera. Uh, Ace, okay, microphone. Sir, follow up lang po dun sa tanong kanina regarding sa agri agriculture. Sir, kasi before may suggestion si Secretary Mariano Nangdar, ang sinasabi niya po na isa sa mga problema daw sa pag -product agriculture productivity yung pagko-convert nga daw ng mga lands, agricultural lands into industrial zones, etc. 
And then, sinabi niya din dito sa briefing before na may pwedeng maglabas si Presidente ng executive order on land moratorium, land conversion uh, moratorium. Sir, would you advise the President to have that executive order? No, I, I wouldn't advise the President to have an executive order to stop land conversion to industrial estates. Especially that um, there are certain areas that they're better off to be to move towards industrialization, bringing more factories, etc. So the, the government will have to define what areas in the country should be focused on agriculture and what areas should focus on the industry. Uh, and definitely, it has to be a balance. No? Uh, it has to be a balance. But we should not discourage if you know a lot of foreigners want to come here and invest in our country and set up factories. Why not? So this has to continue. Land conversion has to continue. It will take time unless, unless we are also able to find a way on how to create agri-lands into solid tracts of land that become a very viable corporate farm. That will match against uh, industrial uh, parks. So in other words, you'll have maybe 1,000 hectares, but you have here maybe 10 big entrepreneurs in agri doing this type of farming. Okay, thank you, Ted. Thank you, Mr. Joey Concepcion, Presidential Advisor for Entrepreneurship, Presidential Spokesperson Ernesto Abella. Morning. <laughs> we have some, uh, I'd like to touch on two points and then uh, we can go on to the Q&A. Joint statement on the successful third round of formal talks between the GRP and the NDP and DFP in Rome in, in Italy. The government of the Republic of the Philippines and the National Democratic Front of the Philippines um, of the Philippines Reciprocal Working Committees on Social and Economic Reforms met on January 20 to 21 and 23 to 24 in 2017 together with their respective consultants and resource persons. The RWCS and SER reaffirmed their April 2004 agreement on the preamble and the Declaration of Principles Part 1 as a framework of the Comprehensive Agreement on Socioeconomic Reforms, provided that the unresolved provisions, including the new insertions of the NDFP, will be elevated to the negotiating panels for their resolution. Also, discussions on the basis, scope, and applicability, part two, were substantially made and points of agreement were identified. The reaffirmation of part three entitled desired outcomes, which was approved during the second round of talks was made. Also, the RWCS SER also started discussions on agrarian reform and rural development they reached a common understanding on the general features of the agrarian problems in the Philippines. They also agreed in principle to the free distribution of land to farmers and farm workers as part of the governing frameworks of CASER. In the next round of formal talks, they shall discuss the remaining items under the agrarian reform and rural development and so forth. In effect, the talks are moving forward and uh, we're gaining actually ground, and that um, the, the, the talks will not be hampered by any activities on the ground, so to speak. Also, the development on the Philippine GDP. Our GDP has posted a 6.6 .6 growth in the fourth quarter of 2016, driving the economy to grow by 6.8% for the entire year. The last quarter of an election year is usually weak due to government transition. However, in our case, it has actually improved. This is higher than the 6.3 growth recorded during the fourth quarter of 2015, and the 6.6 .6 growth in the fourth quarter is a testament that our economy remains robust and is growing at a healthy and a steady rate. Also, the Philippine economy is likely the third or fourth fastest growing economy in the fourth quarter of 2016 after China and Vietnam. 
Overall, we believe that the target of 6.5, 7.5 for 2017 is highly likely and that our strong economic performance is likely to be sustainable in the long run. We're open to questions. Ted Tuvera. Sir, good afternoon po. Related yes. po din sa peace talks. Peace Kasi talks. sir, while nag-uusap sila sa room, uh, merong mga statements tsaka mga galaw yung CPP-NPA na parang hindi nila gustong ipagpatuloy yung unilateral ceasefire. In fact, inamin po ni NDF, ng NDF sa isang statement na na, pa, na may outcry daw sa mga miyembro nila na wag nang ituloy yung unilateral ceasefire. Sir, is the palace worried or threatened that such moves or statements made by communists might uh, distract or hamper the peace talks? The palace understands that there is uh, activity on the ground and there's also noise on the ground. However, based on the negotiating panels and based on the actions and the agreements that have been formed, the, continu the talks continue forward. So we are positive that things can be worked out. Kasi, sir, uh, for considerations din kasi na iba kasi yung <coughs> nasa ground, uh, iba yung nandito sa, sa mga kanayunan kung saan nag-operate yung mga NPA, iba rin yung nasa negotiating table and I believe kahit nung mga 90s, habang nagkakaroon ng mga peace talks na ituloy-tuloy pa rin naman yung operations ng NPA at that time, tingin nyo uh, mangyayari pa rin yun sa kasalukuyang, ano sir? Naintindihan natin yung mga nangyayaring ganun. However, we understand also that the organi their organization is also in conversation with their own people. So let us leave it to them to be able to settle matters among themselves. Thank you, sir. Thank okay, you. follow up. Rose Novenario. Uh, good morning, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon pala. Good afternoon. Sir, ano po yung reaksyon ng palasyo dun sa pahayag kahapon ng OPAP na uh, nagkasundo yung GRP at saka NDFB panel na i-recommenda kay Pangulong Duterte na i-delist si CPP founding chairman Joma Sison sa terror list ng Amerika? Um, we do have an opinion regarding that. The request for the delisting of Chairman Jose Maria Sison is aligned with the President's wish to hold peace talks with the leadership of the Communist Party of the Philippines. The government maintains its position that there's no reason for the U.S. to deny this request, bearing in mind that Mr. Sison is part of the negotiating panel. As part of the Duterte administration agendas for peace, it will take all necessary steps to ensure that the agreements made will be inclusive, comprehensive, and integrated with all stakeholders meaningfully involved in the process of negotiation and implementation. In other words, uh, it seems to be aligned. So, ma ma mag expect po ba yung makakaliwang grupo na asap po itong gag gagawin ng palasyo or ni Presidente Duterte? Uh, may proseso po yan. I don't know if it's going to be asap, but it's part of the process. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Rose. Other issue? Ro uh, Rose, uh, UNTV? Um, kunin lang po namin ang opisyal na pahayag po ng uh, Malacanang regarding po sa naging pagtugon ni dating Pangulong Aquino doon po sa mga binitawang statement ng Pangulo regarding po sa mamasapan. Let's wait for the Independent Commission to be formed to look into the matter. That's all. Thank you. Follow up or other issue? Follow up. Okay. JP? Hey, sir. Good morning. Sir, in the three-page statement of President, Aqu former President Aquino, um, it seems to be that the former PNP Gen uh, Director General Purisima was not mentioned. Sir, was there, do you think, sir, this is part of a cover-up of the previous administration to look into the um, onerous acts of the um, PNP General, sir? into the Mama Sapan incident. We will not venture into giving any opinions. Let us wait for the Independent Commission to look into the matter. But sir, the Independent Commission, um, sir, are we looking on the criminal responsibility of the former president uh, for covering up on the 
possible um, possible acts na hindi na nagawan dun sa initial ng mga investigation in the past. It's for the commission to make any comments regarding that. Thank Joseph you. Morong, thank you, JP. Yes, sir. Kailan po bubuoyin yung commission? Uh, Alam mong timeline, but uh, it's going. It's already in the process. Thank you. Okay. Sige, yun muna sa atin. Pero may phone-in question, sir. May short list na po daw ba ang, ang uh, independent commission? As far as I know, it hasn't reached my desk yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, wala pa. Okay. Yeah, Other issue, Raymond Tinasa. Sir, mm, ano na nangyari sa ano? Yung ipinag-utos noon ni Communication Secretary Martin Antanar na investigasyon sa overprinting ng taxi stamps on the cigarette. <laughs> Uh, let's refer the matter to Sec Martin. Kasi okay. mayroon ding parallel investigation ngayon yung BIR. I don't know if it's separate or relatedly. Uh, investigation ng BIR doon sa mga peking stamps ng yung isang kumpanya ng sigarilyo, yung Mighty. So, ano yung mag, sa tingin nyo ito ba ay related o kaya rest assured na kumbaga hindi gamitin ng knowing mighty gamitin yung kanyang yung money influence para makalusot doon sa possible na panagutan from using the alleged fake tax stamps let's refer the matter to the press secretary okay Asa Nichols sir there are calls to declare uh, Monday uh, a holiday because of the <laughs> Miss Universe pageant <laughs> is the palace inclined to heed the calls I don't know about the inclination of the palace, but, <laughs> but uh, there's no official word yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, sir, yeah, follow up. Is the president attending the pageant? Um, uh, I think he wishes he could, but I don't know about his own schedules. Okay, Laila Salaveria, to be followed by Dexter Ganibe. Sir, yes, another sir. topic. Sir, wh what's the purpose of the president's um, tirades against the Catholic Church officials? Um, is he trying to tell them to stop commenting on his drug war because I think that that is what triggered his statement. So what, what does he plan to accomplish by his uh, statement? Um, in a conversation I had with uh, Mr. Failon, I pointed out the fact that uh, it's not so much a tirade, uh, tirade against the Catholic Church per se, but simply about, uh, it's simply one institution, government institution, regarding a religious institution and um, the, while, the, while, we, while the government is open to critical, uh, to criticism, it is, uh, I think it would appreciate if it were not adversarial and coming from a moral high horse. You know, I mean, after all, we're all referring to simply one country. We're all building up one nation. And I think the president would appreciate it if people came not from a, from a moral high horse, but agreeing, and like he says, he says, basically what he's saying is, hey, we're all sinners here, right? <laughs> And that we can all cooperate in the work, but uh, not from a place where somebody else is saying, I'm better than you, I'm holier than you. That seems to be where he's coming from. That he would like more collegiality, or he would appreciate more collegiality between institutions. Given that, um, yung, yung proposal for the president to hold a dialogue with the bishops, uh, where it is was it not now? a proposal coming from the president. It was simply an opinion that I said ah, okay. that uh, wh why, do why doesn't one institution, if it feels that it has this uh, moral responsibility, reach out to the government and, uh, and create, a, uh, create a bridge where they can actually talk? I mean, after all, both have resources. Both have apparently the same, uh, the same goals, which is nation building. Uh, that I, uh, for, uh, where, where, we were where I was coming from when I said that was that it would certainly benefit the government and the nation if we uh, w were less adversarial, critical, yes, but less adversarial and create a, an atmosphere of collegiality. So have you floated the idea of a dialogue with, between the pres with, with the president, dialogue with the bishops? Come again. Have you floated to the president the idea of having a dialogue with the bishops? And uh, was he receptive to it? Not directly. Not, I haven't floated it directly. We haven't, it ha the idea has not been floated directly to him. Not from my end. Okay, thank you, Laila. Dexter, follow up. Yes. Sir, good afternoon. Follow up lang din, doon sa issue ng bishops. Yes. Dahil nabanggit nyo na pwede kayong maging 
bridge para dun sa dialogue. Uh, during the radio interview, yes, yeah. I said that. Yeah. May may ano na po ba? May may uh, on the part ng church may nag-approach na po ba sa inyo na uh, handa silang magipagdayan? Directly to me, none. So walang tumulong. Wala po silang me. ano, but I did say that in in the radio. Yeah, but to me, none. Uh -oh. uh, pangalawang issue, sir. Madalas nating marinig sa Pangulo yung kanyang pagsusulong ng federalism. Yes. And uh, the House of Representatives uh, naghahantay na po dun sa 25-man team na bubuuin. Yes. Uh, mayroon na tayong executive order. Mayroon na po bang listahan dun sa 25-man team na mag-review sa... Yun din tinatanong mo kangina. Uh, no, as of now, I am, uh, wala po akong ano nun. Wala akong... Uh, So, so, kailan, so, kailan po mabubuo ng palasyo dahil ang binabanggit ng House ay nakadepende rin sila sa palas. Eh, ang Pangulo, halos binabanggit niya palagi sa kanyang mga speech yung pagsusulong ng federalism. I'm sure the only thing that matters, uh, the, the, the main consideration is people that he can trust. That trust people are trustworthy, not necessarily people who are just going to say yes to him. He's not looking for yes men, but he's definitely looking for people who are worthy of trust. So ngayon, sir, wala pa. Blanco pa yung 25 months. Hindi ko po alam kung blanco na, pero alam ko hindi pa natatapos. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Dexter. Ted, to be followed by Joseph. Sir, follow up lang po dun sa issue ng mga bishops. Sir, kapag, kapag pinupuna po ni Presidente, sinasabi niya na yung mga oh, yung simbahan dumadalda lang. Sir, at saka, ano, is he trying to silence the church? Is he trying to hamper their freedom of expression? No. Uh, like I said, he, he, he's open to criticism. Y yun lang na, we do not, ap we do not approach uh, the situation at hand from an adversary. Hindi tayo magkalaban. We can be critical of one another. Hindi tayo magkalaban. Iisa yung bayan. So we're both interested in doing these things, but we cannot do this from an adversa adversarial position. But is it necessary to say, sa kaso ni Bishop Bacani, sabihin niya na may dalawang asawa si Bishop Bacani, Is it necessary? I don't know if we call it ne necessary, but it certainly adds scholar to the conversation, right? Uh, but I mean, no, I mean, he's not trying to be colorful. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not, that's, not, not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying that he's bringing out certain aspects of the, of the, of the dialogue, quote unquote, between the two of them that really, uh, from, from the president's point of view, he do, don't approach me from a moral high horse moral high horse. I mean, sinasabi mong uh, we are the bringer of death and stuff like that. When you yourself, that, that, that is the tenor of the conversation. R really, you know, really, it should be, what he's basically saying is that we should approach it from a different situation. He's yeah. not trying to silence them. He's just trying to say, as far yeah. as we can see, to have a more collegial. Mag-usap tayo parang pantay-pantay. Thank you, Ted. Last three questions. Joseph Morong, AC, and then JP. Sir, with regard to Bishop Bakani, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you were there at the SAF uh, event, but the president said and alleged that uh, Bishop Bakani had two wives based on the book. But yeah. it seems, sir, that it's not stated in the book that he has uh, two wives. Was the president wrong, or did he mix up certain information from the books? Uh, we, no, we're entering into a territory which is, uh, which is really best kept to conversations not on air, you know. Well, the president said it in the speech. All right. Uh, well, pr technically, apparently, the, pre the, 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 uh, the man of the cloth is not married. But uh, apparently, apparently, the, what the president was referring to, that he has fathered, he has fathered children. But uh, Bakani, sir? Or is it a different b priest? Uh, you know, maybe it's best left unsaid. Okay, but no, but the president mentioned it. And it seems that if it is from the book, he might be not accurate. Okay. Uh, the point, point of accuracy, the man of the cloth is not married, right? Correct. But he has fathered. Apparently, that is the implication. You're referring to Bishop Bakani, sir? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sir, ang sabi ni Bishop Bakani, well, related topic, magbibigay daw siya ng five million if the president can find a wife of his. Okay, well, let's leave the betting to them, okay? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay lang, sir, i-call nyo? No, Alin, I, I, <laughs> hindi ko kino-call. Sinabi ko nga hindi, eh. Layaan natin sila mag-usap. But it's, it's a point of technicality. It's a point of technicality in their conversation. It's not some... Really, we're trivializing the whole matter, okay? Let's, let's elevate our conversation. Uh, and let's sir, we didn't it. start this. The president started this, sir. You're asking it, right? So I'm asking if we could just leave it alone for a while. So okay? you... Sir, so I... 
Wag niyo ayun na patulan yung clean out ng presidente. Ayoko pong patulan <laughs> yung ganung pag-uusap in this yan. Uh, sir, uh, appointments question lang. Sa BTC sir, yung MILF mo kang impatient na sa cuz yung yung crafting the law is tedious and you know what happened to the BBL. We will look into the matter. We'll ask uh, we'll ask uh, uh, messaging to get get us the final answers BTC, regarding sir. Okay. Thank you sir. Thank you Joseph AC and then JP. Sir, just a follow-up on the bishops. You were saying earlier <laughs> right. that... Sir, we can't leave it alone, can sorry, we? Sorry, <laughs> sir. Um, just about what you said on yung, the president's trying to say na hindi tayo magkakalaban. Oh, oh, oh. And uh, we cannot do this in an adversarial position. Yes. But sir, yung mga statements po ni uh, Pangulo sa mga speech niya, criticizing uh, the bishops, priests in general, right. hindi ba hostile din talaga sir kasi yung position niya, the way he speaks? So, hindi ba contradicting yun na he, he, he wants na magtulungan tayo and yet he's saying those things in I, public? Right. In a sense, it's a reaction. You can say that these are reactions, no? But these are also responses. This is also his point. If you actually look at the tenor of his, what he's saying, if you look at the tenor of what he's saying, he's basically saying, don't, I mean, leave, uh, it's a pot calling the kettle black, you know? So, so, <laughs> so sir, uh, Pat, who's going to make the, the first move na parang, Let's just work together. Let's not do this. Let's not bash each other in public. Is Correct. The president I think you said it. Yeah, you, you know. <laughs> not in public. Send out, send out feelers. Let's have conversation. You know, I mean, they are, they are a powerful institution that will be listened to, right? Is the president willing to make the first move? Siyang mag-send ng feelers? Sinasabi ko po, yung the one who seems to have moral ascendancy, who says it more, should be should be the one to reach out, you know? Sabi ko nga, wala namang matigas na tinapay sa mainit na kape, hindi ba? So, mag-usap tayo. Okay, thank you, AC. JP, last question. Opo. Sir, hindi na to bishops. Oh, hindi na. <laughs> Salamat naman, JP. <laughs> Sir, can you get Palas' comment on 6.6% GDP growth fourth quarter 2016? I already did, right? I mean, Next na pala. Oh. Sorry. Okay. JP, next time you come. <laughs> Sorry na, sir. Okay. Oh, hindi Bishop na. Uh, okay, thank you, Malacanang Press Corps. Thank you very much. Thank Good you, morning. Presidential Spokesperson Ernesto Abella. Back right. to our main studio sa Radio Nabayan at PTV4.